my first ever client said, I don't have, I don't have the resources internally to write tenders. I can't afford to engage a professional. And there is a big difference. You get what you pay for in this industry. And so it made perfect sense. He had a coach. It made perfect sense to him to outsource that expertise. And as a result, I took him from about $700,000 turnover to 11 million turnover in five years. He'd been bidding for uh, local government work right up to that point and having a hit and miss response. And I, I got him to that size because we didn't lose any. What is up, party people? We've got a special episode for you today. We speak with the chair of the Inside Awards Committee, Sue Finlay. Sue recently successfully executed the first virtual awards night for Western Australia in response to COVID-19. She is also a successful businesswoman and my mother. That's right, we're interviewing my mom. In addition to being my mom, Sue is also the managing director of Bid Buddy. That's B-I-D, Buddy. Bid Buddy are proposal and tendering specialists based here in Perth. Bid Buddy boasts an impressive tendering win rate of more than 80%, bringing real value to their clients. Sue gives us an insight into the world of procurement, tendering, and the common mistakes that business people make when they tender. There's some great takeaways in this episode, and if you've ever wondered why you're not winning enough tenders, then this is the episode for you. So this is Sue Finlay, and we have here as well Alex Damo, who are actually related. <laughs> the summary here is, is that Sue is Alex's, Alex's mother. <laughs> so let's get this out of the way first. So what do you have to say about our successful man, Alex, here, and any embarrassing stories in oh, his childhood? Geez. Get it out of the way, and then we can move on with this show. <laughs> <laughs> you want a, you want an embarrassing. Well, first of Not all, too embarrassing though, and no, definitely no. like no, before, hit, me with, hit me with what you got before high school age. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I'm very proud of my son. I have to say that. Put that out there. And and I was warned that this might be a question, so I was thinking about all of the many times. Uh, many stories that I have about Alex, but my, one of my favourites is when we were driving from Launceston down to Hobart in Tasmania. So it was about 8.30 at night or 9.30. It was getting late and I was flying down the road and we needed to stop and get some food. So we pulled over at this service station in this lonely little town and, uh, you know, the, the place was dark and it was real Hicksville you know, in that it was probably a 50 horse town. And uh, we went into this service station, which doubled as the shop and, and everything else. And there was a middle-aged woman standing behind the counter serving us. And she, uh, she looked like, you know, a lot of middle-aged women, you know, a few chin hairs, a bit of a moustache, but nothing too, <laughs> nothing too bad. And, and obviously a woman, and I'm, talking to her and, and I'm buying the meat pies and the Coke and whatever. And Alex is at my side and he must've been about seven or eight. And he's like, mum, 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 mum. I said, what? He says, that's a really ugly man. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just, I just kept talking like this is, this boy does not belong to me. I don't know where he came from. <laughs> <laughs> gave gave him a, a glare of daggers and and slunk out with our meat pies and our coke could never to return i was gonna ask the swift <laughs> exit must have been hard yes. <laughs> uh, poor my, woman. so my next question is <laughs> alex do you actually remember that no thank god no <laughs> it's gone from your memory okay all right well elephant's gone let's just jump straight into it shall we I'm curious about, so this, this is about BidBuddy. And I think a good way to introduce BidBuddy is, Sue, tell us about yourself, BidBuddy, what it does, what it stands for, and we'll move on from there. Okay, so the BidBuddy story had started in 2003 when I quit my safe, secure 
job as a public servant with the Department of Treasury and Finance as it was then. And my job at that time was needing government procurement in a particular area of whole of government procurement. And when I left, I didn't have anything to go to. But what I found was a lot of people who I used to manage on contracts, so my contractors reached out to me and asked them to help, asked me to help them write a tender response because I knew the other side. And so fast forward many years, when I went back and I looked at where I made most of my money, it was in writing tenders. So I thought I probably should get serious about this and just focus on one product. So I killed off that business name, started up a new business name, Big Buddy, went and got myself qualified in neuro-linguistic programming. All the way along, I'd been doing a lot of lecturing in strategic procurement and marketing management and strategic marketing at Curtin University to MBA students. I've been doing that since 2000. And, and I was also doing a lot of work for other companies like some mining companies and other government departments, helping them with their procurement. So I've continued to work both sides. And I think that's what gives us our edge. We help companies prepare to win business with large corporates, um, mostly government and mining and oil and gas, but you know other mature buying organisations as well. And we do it in a way that positions them against the clients, the buyer's requirements. And that's where my NLP comes in. It helps with the strategy. So as a result, we have a very, very high success rate in helping my clients win business. The other thing that I'd also do is help them get ready with their collateral. So their, their proposal templates, their capability statements, all of the plans that they need, anything that they need to make them look for business whilst they're preparing their bids. Do you ever find that people, a lot of businesses think they can just do the tender applications themselves and how do you, you know, how, how do you approach the the person who thinks they can just do it themselves? Do they come to you after they've failed a few tenders? Not normally. Once they've failed a few tenders, they decide that's a mugs game and they never go back to that again, unfortunately. And and it's a sad thing in our industry that you know, a lot of people who, who have a, a, a computer and can write a bit think that they're able to write tenders without understanding that it is a as an expertise in the past i've uh, run classes you know training workshops training people in how to write tender responses and i'm i'm shocked at their understanding of the process and therein lies the problem because if they don't win and they get feedback what they're mostly told is oh you lost because of price and that's usually the last reason why they lose. I'm not saying that people never lose because they were too expensive, but if 10 people bid for the same piece of work and 10 people said the same sorts of things, then it becomes a price conversation because there's nothing else to differentiate those organisations from each other. If you write your proposal well and you have done the the preliminary work that's needed to get you to the point where you're actually responding to a formal request, then you have a good chance of, of winning regardless of what price, as long as it's within the buyer's budget. So where does, where does the difference between a proposal and a tender really come in then? So it's a good question. John, the difference, the main difference between a proposal and a tender is, and I'm, I'm differentiating proposals from requests for proposals because requests for mm. proposals and requests to, for tenders is a formal buying process. It's a competitive process where the company 
packages up its requirements, wraps it up in um, a set of conditions and a, a draft contract and puts it out to the market. And then the process is governed by a series of steps and probity and a process contract and, and so on. Whereas a proposal is where you're working with a buyer and you have, you've had a few conversations and the buyer is interested in what you have to offer and they say, great, send me a proposal. So that's an unstructured, unsolicited mm. bid where it has, it's not governed by a series of rules um, and, and formal steps. So now that we have, let's say we have a client and, or a potential client, and they said, you know, send me a proposal. Like you said, it's unstructured. So how would I know where to start? You know, if I were looking for someone outside that can help me with this, what kind of skill sets do you need to write a winning proposal? That's another good question, John. <laughs> You've all of them today, yeah. So, so when a buyer says to you, that sounds interesting, send me a proposal, what you don't do is send them a proposal. <laughs> of course of course i see right it's it's more of a, a process than that so the proposal the document they're asking for should be nothing more than a formalization of the conversations that you've had with them right so when they say send me a proposal it tells it should tell you that you haven't done your work you haven't done your job properly because what they should be saying to you is, can you please put that in writing? And then when you get to that point, you know it's yours. And then all you're doing is formalizing, documenting and formalizing the offer that you have given them and, and the terms and conditions. And anything you put in front of them should not be a surprise to them. It should never have been, um, it, they shouldn't be getting something that they haven't already had a conversation with you about. Do you know what I mean? It's like all you're doing is just formalizing the agreement. That's interesting. So what, so let's say you have a conversation with a client and price was not discussed. You know, you wouldn't put it in your proposal then because price was never discussed. So does that happen on the next stage? What is the next stage? Um, so, so the first stage is where you're having a conversation with them and you're working out what problem they have that you can solve. Right. Once you understand that, then you can go away and you can, you can set up another meeting and work out what it is that you can do for them to solve that problem. But before you get to that point, you need to know what that problem costs them. Hmm. So if that problem costs them, you know, millions in lost opportunities or whatever, then the price that you put in front of them is a drop in the ocean. It's a blip. It shouldn't even, it shouldn't phase them. So if you were then to come back to them and say, you know, for X, we can solve this problem. Then you've socialized a number with them. It helps if you know how much they can afford up front. So this is a bit of a dance that you do. Yeah. So talk about, you know, what's your budget? And so you, you can cut your cloth to suit their budget. And then you've got that reference point. Their budget is $100,000, let's say. You go, okay, well, for $100,000, oh, we can give you this, this, and this. And then it becomes a value for money conversation as opposed to a price conversation. So you're offering them value for their budget as opposed to offering to solve their problem for a price. Do you see the difference? Yeah, I see. Mm. So you never send a, a proposal, you send a contract. Pretty much, <laughs> pretty much. But everything that's in there, they've agreed. And the last thing you do is send it to them. You should never send it to them. You should socialize it with them. So set up a meeting where you go through it with them. I've done that on many occasions and the client has barely looked at it because they're already sold. They're already sold. But if you, if you, the danger is if you send them something, say an email, then you, you're behind the eight ball. You're then chasing it 
up with them, you know, have you had a chance to look at that? Oh, no. And then the, the problem comes off the boil and, you know, you run the risk of losing it if you don't, if you don't get in front of them and walk them through it because then you can have a call to action in that meeting and hopefully walk out with, with a promise of a purchase order. Since, since the proposal was a simpler or well, more instructed version of a tender, uh, what's the what's the ideal length compared? Because tenders are much a much bigger commitment, I imagine, oh, a lot yes. more time. So proposals are, are, are a bit quicker, a bit more casual. Uh, so what what are we talking? A few pages to to a huge, you know, scope of work with information about the team. How much really needs to go into proposals? Another good question, John. Um, so the first thing about proposals is somebody has to read them. So the last right. thing you should do is put something that's, you know, a tome, an encyclopedia in front of them full of terms and conditions and so on. So the more succinct you can be, the briefer you can be, the better. And there are different types of, there are different sizes of proposals and it depends, it comes down to the value and the risk. So if it's a low value, relatively low value, low risk procurement, then, you, you know, even an email is, is good hmm. um, or a PowerPoint presentation. Um, if it's a higher value piece of work and, and or you know, there's a fair amount of risk, then you would obviously flesh out more details. If uh, this is a competitive process, then there's quite a lot of detail that you need to put in to position yourselves against your competitors. So when you think about what people, what, what decisions um, a buyer has to make, you know, the first decision they make is, can I trust you? Mm. And the second decision they make is, are you competent to do this work? So can they trust you? Well, yes, you've had, several conversations and you wouldn't have got to that point if they didn't trust you. Um, if they resist talking to you and just continue to say, send me a proposal, send me a proposal, there's a fairly high chance that the trust isn't there and, um, and you've got a bit of work to build that up first before they start looking at how competent you are. They're probably just trying to keep you busy, right? So that you'll leave yeah, them alone. Yeah, just blow you off. They're, they're blowing you off. Yeah. Um, potentially. So, and then the second thing is, um, are you competent? That's where, uh, and remember a proposal is a, um, it's an offer. It's a, if they accept that proposal and there is a, a dollar figure or a consideration involved, then that's a contract. Mm -hmm. So your, your proposal needs to be something that you should, the wheels fall off for whatever reason. If you need to, to defend yourself in any way, shape or form, that proposal needs to address everything that you're going to provide them uh, at what cost and under what conditions. So, you know, again, don't make it war and peace, but protect your risks. That's, that's really what that document is designed to do at the end of the day. It's to protect your risk and their risk should something go wrong. Before we continue this podcast, here's a message from our sponsor. We believe that you can create art and beauty with technology. We think big. We move quietly. We are Ninja Software. Rolling back to the whole PowerPoint approach for some proposals, how slick does it really need to be? Does it need to... Do you need to bring in designers? Do you need to bring in marketing teams to make it flash with cool colors or, or is a simple, you know, point dot point black and white document enough. Colors don't make a contract. I have, <laughs> I have this, this conversation a lot with, with some clients, you know, they've got someone in the team that knows in design and, yeah. and they like to make them as flashy and, and beautiful as, as possible. So my advice is if that is done at the expense of the words, don't waste your time. Unless if you are a graphics design company or mm. any, any creative company, 
um, and you are boasting about your, or not boasting, <laughs> if, if claiming that your your documents are beautiful, then well, yeah, if 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 you are if <laughs> if you are selling your creative design services, a graphic design or architect or or you know any of those, mm. then yeah, they need to look flash because that's what you're selling. But if you're selling software development, say, or, you know, managed services, then you're not selling a graphics design component, but what you are selling is a service that needs to be articulated very clearly what that client is going to get. And so that's where you should spend your time. And if you've got time at the end, make it look um, like a professional glossy document, but, but, and I'm not saying that it doesn't need to look professional. It does, you know, but you could work with one template. You could get a graphic designer to prepare you a template mm -hmm. that you continue to use and reuse over time without spending a lot of money each time you're going to, um, you're putting a proposal in front of a client. Uh, you mentioned NLP a while back. So maybe you can introduce NLP to whoever's listening and how it helps proposals. Uh, and, and for our computer science listeners, this, this is not, this is, uh, what's it? Neural linguistic programming, not yeah, uh, natural not, uh, language uh, processing. That's yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, let's define it right now yeah. and then yeah. find out although, more about it. Although they probably are not that dissimilar. Um, so neuro-linguistic programming is using the choice of words to persuade with integrity. Can you expand on that? Mm, <laughs> yes. For example, most people write tenders in the third person. Company, blah, blah, does this. Company does this. Company is very proud to say this. Blah, 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 mm. blah, blah, blah. The most powerful word in the English language is you. Mm. So the choice of the words you use sets a, an internal state in the reader. And in terms of neuro-linguistic programming, if someone you've heard, oh, you've probably heard of kinesthetic versus um, audio versus visual, mm. uh, the way people learn and absorb information. So if you're a kinesthetic person, um, then you would respond better to words that use a have a kinesthetic flavor if you like so instead of saying you can see that um, from this graph this the following results you would say something like you may feel that the results from this graph mean blah 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 so feel is a kinesthetic word as opposed to you can see which appeals more to people who have more um, visual so knowing your target and whether the visual audio or kinesthetic or or a combination uh, can help but also there are different types different styles that you can use i'm not going to go into them here because i'll bore everyone but hmm. there are different styles that you can use when you're you're preparing the uh, writing the tender or the proposal that are more uh, persuasive, if you like. They're more powerful in, in terms of the words that you use. So how, how new and, and recent is the whole NLP approach to writing? To writing? I don't know anyone else. It, else yeah, it sounds chosen. like it's not common. Um, no, it's not. No. A lot of people use it to sell, hmm. like, First, you know, or or it's also used in counselling and coaching, um, but I don't know anyone who's made the conscious decision to just apply it to their writing. Have you found that, not the feedback, but the responses have been a lot more positive when you started applying NLP? Oh yeah, one of my clients rang me, and this is a true story. He he rang me and he said, "Oh, so so I got a call from ex local council." Yeah, he said guy said to me, he was really raving. He said, I don't normally read these things from it. You know, he said, but I read yours from cover to cover and it was a really good read. <laughs> really, <laughs> really is, a, is it that exciting? I think yeah. to read a tender. Just to go back to the, 
language used, I think one thing that confuses people is active versus passive voice. Uh, even when you Google it, the yeah. explanation is not, explained not well. exactly yeah. clear. Yeah. And I know you know active versus passive voice really well. So can you give us a, a real lay person's explanation? Sure. Um, Maybe an you, example. <laughs> yeah. If you, so at the end of the day, um, passive voice is, well, it's called passive voice because it, it has a passive nature about it. It also uses a lot more words um, mm. and it lacks power. Whereas an active voice, which is, so every, every sentence has um, a subject, an object and a verb. So something does something to something, to someone. So I picked up the ball, for example, or I dropped the ball. <laughs> so <laughs> I being the subject, um, the ball being the object and the verb being um, the ball. Now, if you swap the up, subject yes. and the object around and you say the ball was picked up by me, mm. then that's passive voice. It uses a lot more words. And, and is less direct and gets the point across in a very passive way. If you're trying to sell your value, you don't use passive voice because um, people tend to go to sleep when they're reading something written in passive voice. So, um, you know, John closed the door. I could also say the door was closed. And, and this is important in tenders because then it remains delightfully vague as to who closed the door. So when we say something like we will do or the job will be done, mm. it's like, yeah, when, how, <laughs> who by? But if you say we will do the job in this way, then it's, it just has a lot more credibility because you are putting the subject as in who's going to do that in that sentence and it lends a lot more um, confidence that 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 piece of work is actually going to get done so the 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 document was typed janet typed the document mm. the document was typed is passive voice and you can leave off the subject who who typed it or you can add it in it's up to you. There's only two reasons why you would use uh, passive voice in, in business writing. And that's when you want to be delightfully vague. Like, <laughs> unfortunately, nice. on this occasion, your application was unsuccessful. It's a lot nicer <laughs> than saying the evaluation panel <laughs> didn't, <laughs> enjoy, didn't like your <laughs> application. <laughs> yeah, we didn't like you. <laughs> yeah. And, and so when you're imparting bad news, mm. it is, a, is appropriate to use um, passive voice. And also when it is, you want to be vague. You must meet a lot of business owners who aren't confident enough to be like you so they've, they've they've come to you they want help with their tender and they're not confident enough to actually be active in their voice right it's a passive oh, voice god. appeals to um humble people right <laughs> oh god i i had one client who paid me a lot of money to write a tender and then he went and rewrote it in third person <laughs> passive voice and i just thought you're going to lose. And guess what? Cause it was so important to him. It was mm. so important to him. So his default setting, because what I put in front of him was, um, not what he thought it should be, even though he had no term of reference. Um, and it was so important to him and he was so nervous, uh, that he took my new fangled way of doing things and rewrote it and he lost. It's really hard to get over that programming, which says mm. don't stand out don't make big claims, be small. It just feels professional to be detached from what you're writing, I think. It does, but someone's got to read it. Do you want yeah. to read something that was written by someone who wants to be detached, especially yeah, when you're going to part with thousands or millions of dollars? That's no. right. And, and when you are going to give someone thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars, you want it to be with the confident person who says, yes, I can do this. <laughs> this is easy. Yes. I don't yes. even know why I'm responding to this tender. You should just give me the job. Not yes, the guy who says, yeah, 
who waffles. I, th- I think I, yeah, job we'll, will be I, done. I'm, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> Should yeah. we be successful? <laughs> Should, yeah. oh, oh. Should we be successful? Just see, oh. see that's NLP right there, right? When you, yeah. So if you say something like, um, upon award of the contract in NLP parlance, that's an embedded command. Hmm. You will, you will award us the contract. And one of the things that I've learned is if you want people to think something a certain way, you tell them what to think and they do. It's a beautiful thing. That's how politician spin doctors survive because they know you tell people what to think enough, they'll think it. The, the really uh, clear example that you'll see all the time is people with an email and at the end, they'll say, you know, I look forward to seeing you sometime soon, rather yes. than just saying, you know, let's How meet. next Friday? Yeah. Let's I'll meet be Friday. seeing you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. It's, <laughs> it's like a up in the air, you know, mm. because people aren't confident enough to just say, this is what I want. Let's do this. Mm. Yes. I can do this. Let's do this. Yes. Yes. We don't have time to read between the lines these days. Mm. There was a time in the past where uh, you didn't win a tender unless you wheeled it into the um, tender's office on a trolley because that told the buyer that you'd put an awful lot of effort into it and you really wanted this job, which doesn't mean that you're the most competent bidder and you can do it for the best price. It probably means you're not the most competent bidder because the most competent bidder has enough work on that they they have to make the conscious decision to even write the tender in the first place yes times have changed the trolleys the tender on a trolley doesn't um doesn't cut it anymore because people just don't have time to plow through all that stuff if you put that size document in front of them get what do you think is going to happen no one they reads will, it they won't read mm. it they will skim it so They'll look at the beginning and they'll look at the end. They'll look at the exact summary if, if one's been asked for and has been provided and they'll look at the price and the middle bit, you know, and that's the bit where, so you've squandered an opportunity to really sell your value. What's the biggest misconception that business owners have? That you lose on price. Hmm. That's, that's an a, interesting one. That's a good misconception too. Stop being cheap asses is what you're saying. Well, look, um, if you're selling a commodity, then Mm. it's all about price because there's not a lot to differentiate a commodity from one supplier from another. And that's the definition of a commodity is it's something you can buy from anywhere. Mm. And so if, so that specification is locked down tight. So what else can differentiate one supplier from another? Well, you could, you could run a service around it and differentiate yourself that way um, or you've got to come in cheapest there's that's the only problem with that's you know that's all there is to it whereas if you're offering a a, a niche service or a bottleneck service something that uh, if that supplier doesn't get that it it slows their business down or impacts the business in some way then there is a cost to poor delivery or no delivery. And that then is your opportunity to differentiate yourself from the others because risk becomes an issue and certainty of supply is a concern. So you can differentiate yourself from the others by saying, um, by, by making them feel comfortable that you are a low risk supplier and that you have can give them certainty of supply, you will mitigate all of their risks and you've thought of them all and you've demonstrated how you will mitigate those risks. And that builds trust and confidence in your competence. So on that, if you lose a tender on price that's premised around a bottleneck or a um, strategic or a niche service, then you haven't differentiated yourself from the others and yet it should be easy to do that. So talk about the companies that lie to win the tender and then have to quickly mobilize and make up for their lies. A lot of companies see these big tenders as the strategy they're going to take to get to the next, mm. the, the next step. Like you're a million dollar company, uh, you know, answering a, a hundred million dollar tender. 
Mm-hmm. You must see that a lot. Yeah, and so there's a rule of thumb in procurement where if that tender value is worth more than about 30% of your gross annual turnover, chances are you'll be seen as too big a risk and you won't win it for a number of reasons. Uh, If it's a big buying organisation, they don't pay their bills in in one week. They pay their bills in 30, 60, 90 days. Mm. So you've got 30, 60 or 90 days of no cash flow to pay your people. Mm. And you may have to purchase a, a, you know, a bit of equipment and, and invest in order to uh, service this contract. So you can crash and burn, and I've seen it happen a lot because they have bitten more than they can chew and, and they've just run out of cash because they haven't got the capital. So most tenders that I have done in the last six months have asked for, when I say most, all, prior to six months, companies asked for your financials and, or said, you know, you'll be exposed to a financial review, tell us that you're okay with that. But um, now it seems to be just about all tenders that I've looked at have asked for some very detailed financials because they want to see that you are going to, you're not a high risk from a cash flow perspective and that this is not going to put you under too much pressure. So I guess the short answer is don't bid for work that's too big for you. Mm. They, they, they're not interested if you haven't already got clients roughly around the same size and complexity as you because you're unproven then. You don't have the systems, you don't have the you know, the foundations and you don't, you, you probably don't also have the cash in the bank to float you whilst you're waiting to be paid. Yeah. It's a, it's a pretty common strategy though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I call it hope marketing. So what would you say to the, you know, SME business owners who are still doing their own tenders they hate it because that's not what they love doing. You know, they they run an uh, electrical company or an engineering company or, you know, that that's what they love. They don't like writing tenders, but they're still doing it because they don't value it. Maybe because they're not winning tenders. Hmm. Get, get them, get them over the line, get them to stop. How, like, what would you say to them right now to get them to, to give up doing that horrible work and get, and start winning tenders by outsourcing it to someone like Big Buddy. I would, so my first ever client said, I don't have, I don't have the resources internally to write tenders. I can't afford to engage a professional. And there is a big difference. You get what you pay for in this industry. Um, and so it made perfect sense. He had a coach it made perfect sense to him to outsource that expertise. And as a result, I took him from about $700,000 turnover to 11 million turnover in five years. Hmm. He'd been bidding for uh, local government work right up to that point and having a hit and miss response. And um, I, I got him to that size because we didn't lose any. Um, I had a 100% success rate with him for a number of years until he got so big that they started thinking, no, he's too big. And, you know, the tall poppy syndrome cut in. But And it made perfect sense to him that that was what you did. I got asked the other day by someone who they said, so we've got 13 seniors in the business and they're all writing tenders. Is that what they should be doing? And I said, no, the seniors in the company should be standing on the bridge of the ship directing directing where the ship's going, not in the engine room, stoking the engine. Um, Yes, they have the knowledge and and the expertise and the uh, passion, but they're doing a job that's taking them away from their real job, which is... Doing doing, the work. Doing, being the the leader, Mm. being the leader in the organisation, working on their business, not in their business. And so if 
if you're an SME and you are spending time yourself writing tenders and you love it, great. And you're winning lots, great. You know, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. But if you hate it and you're not winning more than seven out of 10 new business, because mm. repeat business is much easier to win because you're already known and trusted. New business is much, much harder to win. So if you're not winning six or seven out of 10 new business, then you need to put it in the hands of a professional. And even that seems like a high number. I think there'd be a lot of companies out there that are two to three out of 10. Right. Hope marketing. But if you can win one out of 10, you can probably win a lot more. Right. Yeah. But, and, and look at the maths, right? So if it costs you um, $5,000 say in internal time, and you add on the lost opportunity costs because you're focusing on that act of action and not on uh, going out and um, you know, doing more business development. Because tenders are the end of the pipeline. It starts, as I said earlier, it starts with you identifying a prospect, you're finding your market, engaging with your market, and then fostering and farming that that opportunity until the point where it pops out the end with a proposal or a temp or a tender. And by that stage, it, all it's needed to do is give them something competent that um, makes it easy for them to pick you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you're looking at the, um, uh, the search sites or you've, you've subscribed to one of these search sites and they're sending you tenders, to then you've not had any engagement with those potential buyers and then you are you know spending your sunday afternoons writing responses that's hope marketing and not a good use of your time and if it's costing you five thousand dollars say and that tender's worth say let's say half a million dollars imagine if you and and you you spent fifty thousand dollars to win half a million dollars imagine so five thousand times ten tenders and you win one out of ten so you've spent five times ten fifty thousand dollars of direct your time to win half a million dollars imagine if you won four more you spent fifty thousand dollars to win four times half a million the maths don't add up for you working on using your own time when you should be working on your business. When, if you spent that money and gave it to someone to improve your win rate, whilst you went and actually met with these people and improved the front end of the, of the pipeline so that it becomes a synergistic relationship or sorry, a symbiotic relationship, you're out there developing the relationships and the tender professional is at the other end converting the sales for you, mm. then that's uh, money better spent. And I've met a lot of salespeople who think they write great tenders. Just look at the, just look at the testimonials on my website. Every single one of those is absolutely 100% true and written by my clients. I haven't written any single one of those. And there's a few who said, I thought I was pretty good with tenders. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> right? Because... Because they had a typewriter and they could type. Or, sorry, they had a computer. Yeah. <laughs> the they, had a, they have a computer and they can write a bit. Mm. And so because they've written a response, a tender response, and they've written 50 of them, 100 of them, it doesn't make them... It makes Good them experienced. It, it mm. makes them experienced, but not expert. Yeah. And especially if they're using the same templates and they're just regurgitating the same stuff that they wrote several tenders back, you know, they're just regurgitating mediocre copy as opposed there's, to winning copy. There's no school to write tenders. And if there are, they're not, they're not joining them. They're there not isn't. attending them. Yeah. Mm. There isn't. No, no, it's, it's, and it's not copywriting. Copywriting mm. is marketing. Tenders is contracting. So there's a big difference and, and I wish the marketing companies or organizations and departments around the country understood that. <laughs> well, maybe you don't because um, then they potentially compete with you. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So, so I have a marketing degree as well as a procurement degree, um, as well as NLP. And I can tell you, I used to lecture all marketing and st uh, strategic procurement and contract and procurement optimization and supply chain management. I'm telling you, the marketing is no tendering is not marketing. And yet there's this universal belief that it is. Hmm. Uh, that business owner we just talked about, he's sitting, he or she is sitting at home right now. How do they get in contact with you? Um, so uh, my website is Bid Buddy, B I D B U D D Y. I'm not Big Buddy, I'm Bid Buddy dot com dot AU. And um, my details are on the website. So if you, if you want to learn, if you want to find out um, how to, what's involved in tender writing, I do have a free course on my website. It's just two hours. There's a few videos to watch and some samples and some templates. Um, jump online and, and watch the videos. And, um, and after that, if you think you're up for it, go for it. My website has got some downloadable tools that you can use. Um, but if it's frightened you enough to realize that you need help, give us a call. All right. Uh, before you go, one question. Where did the name Bid Buddy come from? You. Really? Yes. Yes. I, I wow. had my original business was called Berezco Management Services, which was a horrible name. That is Basque for quality for anyone who's interested in the roots of the word Berezko. And, and when my friend called it Berserko Management <laughs> Services, I, I knew I had to change it. And I'm not good at picking names. So you and I and, um, and your siblings had this uh, brainstorming session and you came up with it. You've forgotten that. Wow, well, yeah. Have I, a go. Well, I don't remember yeah. that at all. Actually, and, like... then we, and then we jumped straight online and registered the domain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I really don't remember that. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> well, now you know, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the I don't know if you remember the mascot that we were going to put on the website um, because the whole the whole uh, meaning of Bid Buddy is that I'm your buddy at your side, helping you with your bidding, mm -hmm. and and we're talking about tendering bidding, not auction bidding. Um, and so, yeah, that's the whole idea is we provide a personalized service you have a buddy sitting in bed buddy who's going to give you all the help that you need brilliant cool thank yeah. you all right so thank you and um peace yeah out. peace out <laughs> <laughs>Made it to the end of another episode of Tech Society. If you're struggling to win tenders or could do with winning more, head over to the BidBuddy website, bidbuddy.com.au. I'd also like to take this opportunity to congratulate all the winners of the Inside Awards last Friday. There were some seriously innovative things going on in Western Australia, so make sure you watch the live stream. It is still on YouTube. Just search 29th Lateral Inside Awards. It was great to see the winners being championed, so make sure you watch. As always, this episode was sponsored by Ninja Software. We think big and we move quietly. Check us out, njs.dev.